AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Ayman Hussein. Ayman is the Director of Customer Success for Intelligent Cloud and Digital Transformation at Microsoft. Ayman, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, JP. Oh, it's our pleasure. Ayman, let's start with yourself. Can you talk us through your journey? Give us some background as to where you first got started in technology, some of the roles you've held along the way, taking us up to just before you made the switch to Microsoft. Absolutely. It would be a pleasure. My journey in technology started uh, right after college. I did uh, have a degree in computer science and engineering. However, I did take a hiatus right after graduation from my my four-year degree to go uh, take, take life a little bit and enjoy it. When I came out of it, it was the end of the 90s, and and there was this resurgence of technology, the dot-com era was just being born. And what I found myself is there was a gap of knowledge of just simple computer know-how. And I landed myself in an organization that was doing a lot of contracting and staff augmentation with large corporations. And that's when I really got my start. And what I did in that day and that back then was essentially end-user computer support. And that gave me a a personal feel to talk to people and, and knowledge was exchanged by understanding what they were doing. I worked for a large industrial manufacturing company at that point, and I could see all these scientists and researchers struggling with technology. And it gave me this empathy at that point to understand how technology or the lack of good technology is impacting progression, either it be in the sciences or just in, in business itself. And that gave me the ability to jump into management consulting. Uh, as my I matured my career and knowledge, I, I found myself with organizations that consulted with large organizations. And by virtue of technology and evolution, I walked myself from end user computing through the life cycle of data centers and hyperscale computing, landing into the cloud technologies, which is right before where I joined Microsoft. So until Microsoft, I was a professional consultant, a management consultant, really did not work for a large company directly or have uh, had experience working with an organization where a product was the focus like today is in Microsoft. I joined Microsoft about three years ago. And ever since I've been with the Azure business unit, which is uh, the public cloud entity that focuses on hyperscale computing that Microsoft owns and delivers today. Excellent. Thank you for that. I, I think it would be good to tell the story about the transition from your consulting um, role into Microsoft, because it was very much a case of um, somebody identified the, the value that you were adding and that sort of initiated the conversations. Could you give us some insight into how that came about and what was your thought process, having always been in the smaller consulting world to then switch over to you know, one of the most well-known technology companies of all time? Absolutely. Thank you. That, that's that's a great segue. So one of the things I was doing as a management consultant, a professional services consultant, was focusing on outcomes, right? One of the things you do as a consultant is you're billing for every hour you're working and you're trying to get more hours to bill. So you're creating scope of works, so you're focusing on outcomes. You talk to the decision makers, the sponsors, and ask them what is it they want to achieve at the end of the duration of the engagement. And based on that, you would actually craft your services and deliverables, either be plays or it be be a programmatic exchange of services to give them that outcome. So in the world of Microsoft, which is predominantly a product company with many different things on the portfolio of products, they do everything from desktops all the way to the cloud. One of the things that Microsoft was growing into is this ability to focus on outcomes. Traditionally, Microsoft focused with the vendor management or IT managers. They really did not focus on the board or didn't have great connections at that levels where outcomes were focused. So when Microsoft approached me uh, to recruit me away, one of the things they came to me and explained is like, hey, we have this public cloud solution capability. We have Office 365, we have Azure. The ability to commoditize and go into this economies of scale that is based on subscription economics, which is to use as much as you want for the duration of time you have, 
is based on outcomes. They have something they have achieved in a very fast amount of time. And the certain language of speaking with business decision makers, either be the board or just IT managers or business owners, you have to have that consulting acumen uh, and some of it in your DNA. So that was what drew, drew me into the role that Microsoft came to me and said, hey, we were creating this customer success organization. It's about the success of the customer for their customers. So if you're in healthcare, your customers are the patients and your outcome is to save them and heal them. It is not about how much uh, Windows and Azure you have. And so when you focus on that outcome, that metric becomes very easy to translate to a business sponsor and then by virtue of technology, achieve a goal of success. And that's how I find myself into this customer success arena where I'm focused on the customer's outcome for their customers, not what Microsoft cares for their outcome. Microsoft is a profit organization. We will always make money on profit. We get that. We know how to go do that. We need to now make sure that we focus on our customers' outcomes and by virtue of that, becoming a partner to their success. Makes sense. And thank you for that. So focusing on your your current role now, um, Director of Customer Success, Intelligent Cloud and Digital Transformations. Can you give us some insight into what, what's involved? You know, what is your scope? What is your remit? Can you talk us through some real life examples of the impact you're having, particularly as you mentioned there, the importance of working with the C-suite non-technical staff uh, to get the buy in to invest in these uh, the cloud and digital transformation projects? Absolutely. So I'll use a, a couple of examples that I'm going to stage on uh, in the context of this conversation. So today we are on the tail end of the pandemic, the coronavirus, right? So one of the things we have is a lot of companies are working uh, either remotely or trying to adjust to this new way of doing business. So if you think of what the decision makers missed in this virtue, it's like if you're a financial trader, if you're doing stocks and bonds or the stock market, you look at historic records of ups and downs. You're looking at charts and graphs to figure out what the trends are. You're looking at candlesticks to figure out where, where the supports are, when things are going to turn around. But in the world where you have an unknown like this virus, a pandemic that came out of nowhere, even with all the data that you have, you could not predict it because the nearest data point of this magnitude would have been during the Spanish flu, which happened almost 100 years ago. And that data then was very uh, small and probably not digitized enough to have that context that's available for e experimentation and research. So when I talk to decision makers, when well, the job that I have is to ask our customers how much data they have. You know, we are in the data business. Data is the new currency. The data itself is not going to solve your problems. The visualization, the analytics, the, the, the forecasting, the trends, using some experimentation. If you're going to create a new algorithm, does it work? Does it predict? Weather is a great example of that. We have enough weather data, historic weather data. So if you create a model for hurricanes or typhoons, you can take the old data, run it through that model to see if it really predicted the outcome that model already has. And so when you think of that, what I do is connecting with these decision makers to ask about their jobs. If you're talking to a CFO, the CFO is probably worried about the fluidity of their stock, the cash, their debt, whatever they need to do. Uh, if it's debt ridden, then they have a revenue stream. Where is the revenue coming from? How much of it will be coming through? They have systems, ERP systems, financial systems, uh, HR systems that have all this data, but they're not connected. So when I talk to my uh, uh, sponsors or uh, business uh, buyers, one of the things I use is, is a present a challenge, a challenge of mindset. It's like, what is the cost of not doing these things that may impact? So if you of that look at the doing the things that the manufacturers are plagued with today in the the coronavirus era they had enough supply they had enough raw materials but they could not catch up right because a big chunk of the supply chain which was in the eastern part of the world uh, stopped uh, because of the the impact of the pandemic so uh, raw materials weren't in being used to manufacture the secondary raw materials for the products they needed so there was a big supply chain hiccup because of that. It wasn't that factories are shut down because people didn't show up. They just have raw materials to do that. They have everything from computers, mobile phones, devices, everything was impacted. All of that could have been uh, brought together if we took all that data from supply chain, vendor, payments, and had some level of analytics and empowering that decision maker to understand how their business works. So almost the journey of how do you business works is sometimes siloed and segregated because the companies get too large or they get to the point where they don't have the downward impact. 
I use coding an example of it. In the today's world, we have programmers and developers that code a lot of different things, but they're compartmentalized. They're doing input and output. Somebody writes a procedure or a little bit of chunk of code, they give it to someone in the next door that takes that chunk of code and does different things. If you don't know what those chunks of code are gonna pile up to create the vision, that main app, you may miss a big part of it. Maybe you miss the cache or you maybe miss the pipeline consistency or some variables. And then that code may have bugs that you have to now solve three, four years down the road when somebody really figures it out. So that's the way I look at the world is we are missing chunks of the data or we have the data, but we haven't connected. So my day job is understanding that business outcome that everyone is doing. Uh, even in the nonprofit world, there's an outcome that somebody's looking to achieve and succeed with. It's really good to hear you make the, the parallel connections between your, your business outcome focus from consulting and how that's now at the, the, the forefront of what you're doing for Microsoft. Um, could you give us some examples of, of, of what you've been working on? Um, I know you've been there now. It's coming up on, on three years. Any highlight projects that would, would demonstrate the, the impact uh, as you can have? not on the consulting side, but, but internally at, at Microsoft, but still Absolutely. taking that client-first client, client first approach. Yeah, so I, 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 by virtue of my residence in the U.S., uh, I have a focus on a lot of oil and gas. And one of the things of an oil and gas, if you know these uh, operators like the Exxons and the Chevrons and, and the, the Chambergers of the world, they put a hole in the ground to pull out product. And that hole in the ground is based on data that they've collected over eons of business so to speak right they're using thumpers to get radio data they're coming getting radar data but that's so much data that state is saved in tape and storage that in the heyday of oil and gas what these customers would do is just put a hole in the ground figure out if it's going to be productive by controlling how much product they could get and then sometimes they shut down the well and move over uh, in this new era, because money is tight, because decision makers are worried about uh, the ability for us to drive uh, demand one of my customers and what Microsoft did is challenge them to figure out, can you create uh, reservoir simulations that are in the digital space, essential digital twins of your operations, right? So we took all the data that they already have. They have IoT data, they have data coming from uh, uh, process control logic uh, gates, Let's take that and emulate what a drilling operation would look like. And, and we're going to do this using Microsoft Azure Public Cloud. Uh, and what is the public cloud? It's essentially a bunch of computers and storage that you, must, Mr. Customer, do not need to buy. But we'll take all your data, we'll ingest it, we'll create the logic patterns that looks like a refinery or like a drill bit or a, or, or a truck that's moving a product from one place to another. And we'll create this emulation. And based on the seismic data that you already have, and the seismic data is are terabytes and terabytes of data, zeros and ones that have to be crunched, we crunch it, we run it, and then we give them a scenario of a simulation. Now, the way Microsoft wins the, the conversation here is we say that you can use as much capacity as you need to get your outcomes. Instead of using 10 computers or a cluster of them, use as much as the capacity is required to get to your outcome result before you even put the first hole in the ground. So that's one of the things Microsoft is doing in the energy and oil and gas is we're helping our customers make better decisions that saves the economy, that saves the environment, saves uh, pollution, because you're not doing arbitrary uh, physical work that may ultimately not provide a productive oil uh, uh, generating pipeline or a, a oil field. And so that ability to convince a customer that we have done in one of the major oil and gas players is created this digital simulation of the entire reservoir and operations in the virtual space of uh, Azure computing. So they can actually sit in their computer as if they're looking at real stuff, but it's all digitized in the back end using simulated data to predict how their outcome would be. And it's based on real science at that point. Thank you for those examples, Ayman. It's great to hear um, how you're going about doing this and, and, and some of the organizations who are benefiting from this. Um, switching directions, you and I spoke previously about what you're excited about, personally interested in as you look ahead for the, the broader adoption of cloud and digital transformation. And one of the things we spoke about was democratization of data and what that actually means, because there's a lot of hype behind that just as there is a hype behind the title of AI. Um, so it'd be great to get your take on, on what it means uh, for democrat democratization of data, uh, how that's going to impact businesses and, and how people can move towards that. Absolutely. That's a great topic and one of very, very strong passion for myself. 
So when I think of democratizing data, one of the things I'm looking – in the world of democracy, you look at rights, right? I'm looking for access to data. Today in the enterprise world, in the commercial space, access to data, even in your within company walls, is very challenging. So the first part of democratizing the data is getting access to data. Now, people that will put blockers on accessing data will have legitimate reasons. One of the biggest legitimate reasons is security and containment of the data. They don't want data to leak out. It's fortunate we work in a world where encryption has reached a level of ease and efficiency, and you can encrypt it in a way that even if the data is leaked out, it has make, makes no bearing or no sense because the data structures won't make sense. So one of the things I look at democratizing data is giving access to, of data to about everybody that can have it, even if they don't need it. Just because you're the person at the door of an office that's uh, welcoming visitors into your building, you don't need to know the data of how your operations are running running KPIs that may have no relevance to you doesn't mean that you don't get to see it. If it's publicly available data that is not secured because of competitive reasons, you should have access to the data. You should be able to do it. In the U.S., we have 10K reports and 8K reports that publicly traded companies will publish. That is data that's available. It's in a very archaic form, not usually translatable, but it is available, right? So think about amazing amount of data insights. So when I look at democracy in the context of data, democratizing it, I want data to be available to anybody that has a thought and wants to use it. The second part of it is what do you do with the data and the evolution of data since the beginning of computing has taken different turns. Uh, everybody remembers the Y2K challenge. We had data fields that had two-year codes versus the four that was required when the, uh, the millennial started, right? So when you think of that, we have to understand that data, while it's democratized and available, may not be standardized and available. So when I look at democratizing data, I'm looking at two things. I'm looking for access to data. And the second thing I'm looking at is making sure that the data is relevant in the context that it is going to be usable. So if you are a data scientist or a data database uh, owner, yeah, those are the structures that you look for, the structure of keys and tables and rows so that you have the ability to interpolate and make those data come together to give you the insights. That's part one. That's the biggest challenge that we uh, keeps people like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, AWS in play because we are amazingly good at giving you enough space to dump your data, but we don't know the data because you may come in from different industries. Once you have the data that's democratized in the way of access and privilege and, and control that it looks and feels in a way that represents your organization business, it still doesn't help you, right? You you can talk to CFOs and CEOs and great board members that can make amazing decisions once they look at charts and graphs. But if they have to wait on somebody to give them the charts and graphs because somebody has to know Python to write AI scripts or they need to use uh, scripts to create dashboards – really does not help that CFO or CEO or those board members to come up with insightful decisions right there and then. So the democratizing of data now has to almost get to the place where people that look at the data, the data analysts, the people, the doctors in the field that need to look at patterns of pandemics or the the, 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 the warehouse person that's looking at boxes that are coming in for distribution through uh, lorries and trucks has to understand that they can do something with that data to create patterns. Now for that, we use code. Uh, we live in a world of heavy code. We don't have the ability to just learn C and C++ or Java and just start doing that. It's not really accessible. You have to be a coder and a software engineer to do that. So the next thing I look for is the low code, no code accept, uh, capability. We are uh, rapidly going down that road. A lot of companies have created the ability for you to take the data from a data lake, so to speak, and then you take patterns that you know from workflow and create the, the insights you need either through dashboards or through logic operations for robotic control or otherwise without having to code that. And so when I look at this passionate area of uh, democratizing data, I need to make sure the data is used by the people that are not true data scientists. I don't need an analyst that spent four years in school running uh, statistics just to understand what patterns would look like. They, it needs to be available to everybody, anybody. And, and the way you look at that, in my mind, I, I, had, uh, I grew up in a developing country. In a developing country, a farmer in the field is not going to have the technology if they're trying to figure out water and rain and yield of crops. They may have limited education, especially in developing countries, or access to technology. But imagine if they had the data, the, how much rainfall and water or crop yield, and you gave them the ability to kind of mix and match on an iPad or a device like a, sm a smartphone, that 
farmer in the field can now do some things that are relative to that person's field, uh, even if it's an acre or smaller. We don't have that ability today. We have to work with the uh, data scientists that will be domain experts to do that. And that's one of the things I feel we're going to see a resurgence. And so not only democratizing data, enabling data access uh, for insights through low code and no code. And so I think everybody becomes a, a, a programmer, a developer, and everybody becomes a data scientist just because now you have access to it. We do this in our consumer life as it is. We do that if you if you live in the uh, have countries where you need a thermostat, uh, with the thermostats either that are smart or not are collecting amazing amount of data and you get to look at it through your electric bill or otherwise and, and you as a consumer cannot make decisions not based on the spreadsheets and formulas you, we're democratizing the access to the data as well as the form and that the the aspects of code using low code no code apps to give the access to the human that lives in that room to figure out if it's too hot or too cold not because they uh, had somebody tell them that's how they should uh, interpret the data and it, and it sort of feeds us into the, the final part, which is everyone is becoming an analyst in some way, shape or form based on decisions they make in, in life and in business. And I know you, you've given some some examples on that already, but it would it would be great to finish on that point that the evolution of how data is, is going to shape uh, business uh, from a uh, real world impact to uh, business impact. And and you're you're obviously playing a pivotal role in this yourself, working with organizations to help them democratize data and then use it to make informed business decisions. How do you see this evolving over time and, and what are you most excited about? Uh, so the, it's a great question. So when I think of uh, in the world of, again, enterprise and corporations, somebody usually makes a decision based on a lot of data that analysts or somebody rolls up to them. I envision a future where everybody's an analyst. So you think of the neural net of a brain or a intelligent computing systems that you know control NASA and spacecrafts. Imagine 10 analysts take the same amount of data and they analyze it using their personal knowledge and they come up with outcomes. And if there's 10 people in the room and say nine people came up with the outcome that looks exactly the same, now you can have consensus on that decision making saying this is probably the right thing to do because we all taking the data ourselves using democracy of the data and the access to the tools and processes that can create these algorithms came to the same decision. And this may also help solve some of the problems that we would have in the industry of supply chain logistics. What if that warehouse manager or director that took the same data and came up with this understanding that saying that, hey, I think we're going to uptake of need for XYZ supplies and they send it to the buyer and the buyer saying, I didn't think that was my reports don't show that. Now, if you have the ability to trust the data and democratize that, we will get to a point where the decision making will be consensus based, but not in the way of democracy. It's going to be based consensus on the way of data. So you have five or six people agreeing on a decision making point. The hierarchy of the decision making becomes a collective. And when you have a collective decision making, you have collective vision. When you have collective vision, you have collective success and you all get to the same place at the same time. Uh, you know, if in the world of uh, we have politicized a lot of things in this world where we talk about climate change and the impact humans have in the world. Uh, a lot of people that are getting passionate about making change in this space are using data for their own benefit. They, they, they trust and verify. Like a lot of people say, I don't trust the scientists. I don't start the data, but imagine if you had the data for yourself and you start making your decisions and then you have collective decision making because now you realize these are the things that will impact society or people or enterprise decision making ultimately to the point where everybody is bought into the game. So you become a shareholder in your decision making, you become a sh uh, the vision, uh, the culture of the company changes and when the culture changes, the people are all collectively focused and rowing in the same direction. You have great success. You, you overcome the friction that usually is not uh, uh, well governed in a lot of uh, organizations that do change. I, I came from professional services. Change management and organizational effectiveness was one of the biggest challenges because somebody had a vision uh, in a C-suite, but the, by the time it got to the troops, it did not make sense. The data wasn't there. The data didn't apply to them or they didn't get to see the data. And so they're hesitant to make those changes. So that's the way I think the world will change is when everybody is using that same set of data to come to their same analysis or near the same analysis you will have greater productivity at the end, end, end goal and that productivity will uh, have ch world changing events come with it. This has been amazing, Aman. I really appreciate you coming on to, to talk to us uh, about your background, your journey, uh, and most importantly, the, the work you're doing now from Microsoft. Um, looking ahead, final question for you. 
a lot of people who will be listening to this will, will find it interesting that yeah, there's a, now an opportunity to combine the consulting type client approach internally with Microsoft. How has your department grown and, and, and what will it look like as, as this demand ever increases? What opportunities will there be to combine the, the data side with consulting? That, that's a great segue, right? So today we're still compartmentalized. And what I mean by that, you still need a lot of people that know infrastructure. You need a lot of people that know programming and application development. You need a lot of people that know data or the data scientists or the traditional things that go with that. The way Microsoft's changing, the way my organization is changing is we are getting to the point where you can be almost an expert in all those disciplines and uh, capabilities. And because of that growth, you're getting very unique. You're, you're almost getting to the point where you're an ambassador, not only for a company like Microsoft, but an ambassador for a domain or expertise because you have lived it and done that. So when I look at my organization's growth, that consultative approach of focusing on the outcome is not only just the outcome of the customer, you are now developing your knowledge of that industry, either it be healthcare or supply chain or or manufacturing, you are building retail, you you bring the knowledge and you're learning on top of this ability to solve all those different things that go with the, the, the cloud computing part of Microsoft's business, the Azure space, right? You, you, you're you looking at from end to end and that end to end vision is what I think is empowering almost everybody. We, we have to have an end to end ownership of what it is. You can't just come in, in the middle and just check out. And so in the world of Microsoft, in my work, in my job, I'm not just looking at, hey, I need to do more Azure sales. So let me just focus on the fact that if I can get you to the cloud, I'm going to win this conversation. I need to know why you want to get to the cloud if you have a des- des- destination preferred. What is it going to do for you? I need to know from the beginning to the end and then come back and see if that outcome was met, right? We forget the consulting approach was if you like me, you will probably buy more from me. And sometimes even if if I couldn't solve your problem, you'll buy from me again. In the world of product, in the world of Microsoft's and Google's and AWS's, if you have a bad experience, you likely don't come back and we need to solve that. And that's how the consulting approach coupled with ext- extraordinary uh, knowledge of data and AI, you can always solve something or maybe not solve it successfully, but your knowledge, your capability, that uniqueness that you will bring becomes more relevant to that customer and position ma- maker. And will they always come back to you for more ideas? Uh, it, people don't look for answers from Microsoft. They want to know that you'll go with the journey to solve that. We, we don't uh, solve people's uh, health problems. We're not healthcare, but we have tools that may give you the ability to do that. So we want to be the partner. So when you think of a company like Microsoft or any other company, being a partner is humongous and of great importance. And that's the way I would wrap this up. It's like you have to be a partner to your customers, either be in the profit or nonprofit arena or education for that matter. You have to be an education, instead of being a professor and instructor, be a partner to the uh, people and the, the person that's being educated because then you will have the end-to-end vision of what the goal needs to be. Excellent, excellent. Aman, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, JP. Thank you for the time and opportunity and uh, look forward for more conversations in the future. AI Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aulus offer an exec search program. Aulus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. Get the Aldus advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to Aldus members. And don't forget our AI on Action podcast. Each week we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.